Kristen Zeman is a lifer of Aurora. She was born and raised in Aurora, went to Aurora High School. If I remember from her bio, she has a bachelor's from, well, a bachelor's from Aurora, a master's from somewhere, and she has been to post Nagel Academy now, getting a second master's. The woman has been everywhere. She's been a part of everything, any sort of police leadership school than this one. With letters attached to it, whether it's that other FBI thing or SNIP or Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, she has even been to Northwestern's Executive Leadership Program for Ladies. Um, I don't know. Yeah, you know what? You're good. You know what? <laughs> She's awesome and I love her and I demanded that she send me this bio and I honestly at this moment I have no idea where it is so I apologize to all of you because I'm not giving her a better introduction. But talk bad about me because she talks next. But anyway, I would like to welcome Chief Kristen Zeman. You. you know what, I, I can come at me because I'm not gonna, I don't have to say anyone's name, so I'm already, I'm already winning. That's, that's great. Um, so uh, I was driving here and I was talking to my kids. My, both my kids just got back from college a couple days ago and I have not seen them since they've gotten home because I've been busy and so I was talking to them on both of them on the phone on the way here and I said I'm on my way to a speaking engagement they're like speaking engagements you had one last night and I said yeah I know I've had a couple of them over the last couple of days and they said uh, we have to make sure that you don't get a big head with all these speaking engagements and I was like oh you don't have to worry about that and then I walked into the lobby downstairs and I walked squarely into the men's bathroom <laughs> so there's no worry about me getting a big head about anything I will just knock myself down so thank you for that wonderful bio by the way um thank you um Greetings, graduates and colleagues and family members, faculty and staff here. So I am very honored to accept the invitation to speak here at this graduation, despite not being a graduate, but I just heard that I'm gonna get an honorary certificate, so I'm totally in. Um, and I'll add that to my bio. Um, um, so I was provided the guidelines to talk today about current issues in law enforcement. Um, so I started thinking about what current issues are in law enforcement, things like mental health, CIT, technology, police suicide, violence against cops, resources, lack of resources, just to name a few. And then I decided not to talk about any of those things that you asked me to talk about. Because uh, you've been through that, uh, through this program, and you can pick up any, you know, uh, a magazine, police magazine, and you can read about those things. So I'm going to go totally rogue. Um, and uh, I also want to provide a caveat about my credibility or authority to give you any advice. I have not yet earned the distinction to say back in my day or anything like that. Um, so that's what I mean when I say I, I, I have no credibility. If you look at the organizational chart of my agency, I am squarely on top. I'm the boss, I get it. Um, but the level of your rank or mine has no direct correlation to either of our, our I, IQ. So I'm under no delusion that I can tell you something here today that you don't already know. So instead, I'm just gonna drop a few nuggets of wisdom that I've learned over the past three and a half years as chief, uh, 26 years in my agency, and you can pick them up or you can leave them. Um, the first lesson I feel inclined to impart upon you involves the reason we've had so much success in my police department. Uh, it has little to do with me and more with my ability to see my own shortcomings and surround myself with people who have the skills that I lack. I've worked for five chiefs throughout my career and four out of five promoted their friends. They promoted those who acted like them and thought like them and I vowed never to do that if I ever got into a position where I could make promotions. Never hire or promote in your own image. It is foolish to replace your strength and it's idiotic to replicate your weaknesses. And that has been such an important lesson that I've learned. And it sounds pathetically easy, but there is a reason that it's not easy. It means that we have to take a hard look at ourselves and acknowledge what we lack. When we have stripes, bars, and eagles, stars, etc., we tend to think it's weak to say, I don't know, or that's not my area of expertise. But once you gain the courage to confront these things in yourself and identify the strength in others, you have built something very special. But I recognize that a lot of you don't have the control over who gets promoted. But even so, it's still a powerful lesson in identity to constantly assess the areas that you lack. 
and concentrate on improving those weaknesses and strengthening the skills you already possess. That's the stuff of leadership. And so speaking of leadership, I'm not exactly sure what it means to be a leader. Simply put, the person at the top of the hierarchy is supposedly the leader. However, if you read top-selling leadership books, it's far more complex than that. Researchers and authors such as Simon Sinek, Start With Why, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Jim Collins, Good to Great, uh, to name a few, tell us that being in charge doesn't automatically make a person a leader. Experts in the field teach us that managers are different than leaders and we shouldn't confuse the two. We are told that leaders should lead from the front until another researcher posits that true leaders take up the rear and allow their people to be seen. One book spouts charismatic leaders are influence who inspire their people. And that notion is contradicted by another author who argues that the best leaders are introverted and quiet. Leaders are born, not made, until the next expert says that anyone can learn to be a leader. Good leaders never ask their people to do anything they wouldn't do themselves. That's my favorite one, and I love that one, but it's not true. I'm smart enough to know that I have no business doing some of the stuff that my people do. And the SWAT team is a great example. I am fortunate enough to sit in the front row of some of these amazing exercises uh, that they do, and I'm telling you, if I were a part of them, I would Leroy Jenkins every situation. Like, I just want to blow stuff up, and that is why I should not do that job, right? Um, so that's my point in all of it, is that I don't know the answer to any of these beliefs. I can only tell you a few things that have worked for me over the years, things I've learned along the way. First and foremost, first and foremost leaders are not relegated to the top of the hierarchy. Leaders are all around you at every single rank. Your job is to develop your own skills in leading others and also recognize those qualities in others. Find your voice and inspire others to find theirs. So what does that even mean to find your voice? It is so trite, but my mission to beat into everyone in a nonviolent way is this simple message. Be you, unless you are an asshole. Don't, don't be, but, <laughs> but be you. And again, that is so trite, and, but I'm telling you, that is the stuff. I get so tired of hearing people say, I'm a different person at work than I am at home. My rebuttal is, it must be exhausting to try to remember who to be based on where you are. <laughs> Naturally, there are sides of us that we reserve for those closest to us. But too many people are walking around in matching outfits just like these, mirrored sunglasses with tool belts, and borrowing power from their position. I walked into my police department at 17 years old as a police cadet. I had just graduated a month before, and in my graduating senior class, I was voted class clown. I know that's very really rude. Um, but everything changed when I became a police cadet. I looked around and decided that I had to leave that old self behind, so I assumed that persona of who I thought I had to be. Three years as a cadet, 10 weeks in the academy, four months in the FTO program left me newly programmed. I was doing well, but I hated it because I had lost myself in the process. And it wasn't until I finally let my personality seep through that a shift occurred. I stopped trying to force my will upon people with whom I came in contact and started using compassion, empathy, humor, and yes, God forbid, vulnerability to diffuse situations. Bad guys bought this and walked into my handcuffs nine out of 10 times. But this lesson was one I had to learn over and over in my career. I became a sergeant nine years later. I had more responsibility, new stripes on my arm, but that was the only thing that was different until I was forced to change. And I was sitting in the roll call room and brand new three week sergeant, you know, the, the stripes are still Velcroed on my sleeve and I'm conducting roll call and it's three to 11 and I'm having fun with all the officers and we're bantering back and forth. I'm giving out assignments and doling out equipment. And there's a lieutenant who sits in the back of the room every day and he just sits with his arms crossed and a scowl on his face. And he never really contributed anything, but he was there every single day. So I'm carrying on my roll call and you know, we're I, I get out of here, all right, have a good day. And he says, the lieutenant, I'd like to talk to you. And I said, oh, okay, sure. Yeah. So I walk into his office and I sit down and it's a door closer. And, uh, and he looks at me and he says, um, I don't like the way you conduct roll call. 
And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, oh, what, 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 what am I doing? And he said, it's too light. I don't like the way you joke back and forth with everybody. You're a sergeant. You need to act like one. And I was like, oh, God, he's right. Like, I'm, I'm a good follower sometimes. Um, and I, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I, I, I get it, you know? I'm a sergeant now. I, I gotta act like it, right? So the next day, I go to roll call, and it's me in front of the podium, and I'm like, you, you're this, you, you're this, and I'm very sergeanty, you know? And uh, so roll call ends, and I'm like, all right, bye. And uh, this goes on, right, until a couple guys are walking up to me afterwards, and they're like, are you okay? Did your dog die? And I'm like, no, no, I'm a sergeant. It's the way I'm supposed to act, right? So I do this for as long as I possibly could. And I walk into that lieutenant's office and I say, can I talk to you for just a second? He's like, yeah. And I said, um, so with all due respect, sir, am I getting the job done? Am I doing the sergeant duties that I am supposed to be doing? Am I giving up the assignments and so forth? And he said, yes. And I said, well then with all due respect, you cannot create me in my own image. Um, your own image, I'm sorry. You cannot create me in your own image. And he just looked at me and, and, and I kept going because that's what I normally do. Um, and I said, listen, I don't know what these guys have gone through during the day. This is 3 to 11 shift, it's 2.40 in the afternoon. I don't know what they've had to deal with, with their spouses or with their kids. And for me, it's like this pop can that we have, like, and you shake a pop can and the pressure builds up inside. And you know, everything that happens, that pressure just keeps building. And so they come into my roll call room, you know, and, and my philosophy is that we should have some fun back and forth because then if we don't, what happens is we're stoic and we just keep adding to that pressure. And then what happens is this, is they walk out onto the street and it's called human transference, you know? And then the first person they're confronted with on the street insults their mom and pretty soon that pop can is just gonna, it's gonna explode. And I said, so what if, we could create an environment where we're having some fun and we're still getting the work done. And for me, it's all about transference, you know? And you know what I'm talking about is when you, when you are around people, think of the person that walks in every morning and they're always bubbly. You hate that person, but you secretly don't because they make you feel better. You want to be around those kind of people. And that's what I'm talking about. That's human transference. And so I said, so what if, you know, we could just, we could, we could release that pressure and we have a little bit of fun so when they walk out on the street, their first contact is a positive one because they're, they're ready for it, right? And so then I got off my soapbox and, uh, and, uh, and I said, oh, okay, so, and he was silent. He said absolutely nothing. And so I was like, okay, that's all. And he said, okay, yeah, go ahead. And I, I, I left. And so I thought, well, that's probably, this is my terminal rank. I'm probably not gonna get promoted past sergeant, but that's cool, whatever. Um, so I walk out and then you know, he didn't tell me not to, you know, he didn't say anything. And so I just went back to being myself again, right? And so he retired about probably about a year later, and I ran into him at a social event uh, shortly thereafter. And I said, remember when I walked in your office and you know, gave you a piece of my mind? And he said, yeah, I thought you had a good point. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. So he did hear me. And, and I, I gave him a lot of credit because even though he didn't say anything, you know, it was, it was his way of not saying anything it was his way of saying, okay, I totally get it. And so this is why I'm trying to build a police department where we defy the notion of living into the templates we think that we're supposed to live into. Because I firmly believe that the more that we bring of ourselves into this profession, the better it will be. The skills and talents that each of us possess should be celebrated and utilized as we do this job. This is not rocket surgery, you guys. Most of what we do is solve problems and diffuse situations, and we do that through communication. And the more that we can use our human influence, the better the outcome. And I've had to revisit that lesson over and over again in my career, but I think I finally got a handle on it. Because I ask myself three questions when I make a decision. Am I doing the right thing for the right reasons and at the right time? And sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes you're doing the right thing for the right reasons, but the timing is off. But if the answer is yes to all three, what's wrong with bringing some personality to the mix? I promise you the job will still get done. And I have the authority on this matter because it was confirmed for me on February 15th when five of my officers got shot running towards gunfire. And so there's this debate raging on whether we police officers are guardians or warriors. And I love this debate and I get it in my community. You know, why do we have that militaristic tank? What is that for? 
You and your officers, you will spend the majority of your shifts acting as guardians to your city. You will solve problems and you will enforce laws so there is order in your neighborhoods and so your citizens can live peacefully. And throughout your tour of duty, there is no doubt that you will show empathy, empathy and compassion to many individuals. And those acts of altruism will never make headlines, but you and your people, you do it anyway. So make no mistake, you are guardians. However, there will be moments where you will have no choice but to transform into a warrior. You are the first line of defense in your city, and when there is someone who threatens the peace and safety of your citizens, you must embrace the warrior mindset and run towards the gunfire. You will put yourself in harm's way and risk your own life because that is what you do as a police officer. It's who you are. So the warrior mindset is what sets you apart from those who don't wear a uniform, and without it, there would be no one to fight the evil that exists. Being a warrior is not a bad thing as long as those skills are applied with good purpose. A true warrior fights only to protect, and the greatest skill of all is to subdue the offender without violence. That should always, always be our goal. But I refuse to pander to the negative perception of warriorship and deny that side of us, because there have to be people willing to go where others will not. So the answer is that you and your officers are both guardians and warriors. So train and expect your people to embrace and hone the skills of both. My biggest takeaway from that event on February 15th was this, not in this particular order. Training, training, training. We have six mandatory trainings per year where we put officers through scenario-based drills so they practice responding to a variety of incidents, including active shooters. On that fateful day, they did what they were trained to do. When I talked with one of them who was in the middle of the gunfire, he told me after the fact that it felt as though he was in a tra training scenario the entire time. You play like you practice. So do whatever it takes to get your people the training and equipment they need for the day you think will never happen in your city. That incident confirmed what I already knew. Your people are your greatest assets. Take care of them. Hold them accountable to a higher standard, but find a balance. That means catch them doing something right rather than always focusing on what is wrong. Train them and give them the tools they need. Have fun and laugh at each other until it's time to be serious. Because when it's time to be serious, they are prepared and willing to sacrifice their lives for their community. You don't have to be the person at the top of your chart to be a leader. You can build a culture that you wish for right where you're standing. In fact, first line supervisors have the greatest influence over the greatest number of people. There's power in that, so use it to tap into the talents of your people. They will, re will reward you by doing good work. And despite what the authors and experts say, I believe leadership is reminding your officers that the work they do is aligned to something bigger than them. When they remember why they do this job, they do this job better. And naturally, the first step is bettering yourselves. And you've done that because you're graduating from this program and that's made you better. You've found your voice. Now go up inspire others to find theirs. Thank you.